Welcome back to Small Caps, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Kerry Stevenson. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. James Garner. He is the CEO of Kazia Therapeutics. ASX code is KZA. They're also listed on the NASDAQ, KZIA. Now, they're on oncology, and I'm going to ask Dr. James Garner to give us a brief overview of the company. Welcome to Small Caps, James. Great to see you. Thanks, Kerry. It's great to be here. And a great opportunity to introduce Kasia. Thank, thank you so much. And uh, as you mentioned, we're an oncology biotech company. That means we do nothing but the development of new cancer drugs. Uh, we're clinical stage. So both of the drugs we're working on are in human trials. That's one of the crucial dividing lines in our industry between those that are more lab focused and those that are more focused on human trials. And we're in that later stage of development. Our lead drug, which is called Paxalicid, is in development for various forms of brain cancer. And then we've got a second drug called EVT801, which right now is a little earlier in the process. And that's still been developed for multiple forms of cancer with an eye to narrowing it down later in development. Uh, you, if, before we get into the drugs themselves and all that, uh, you've recently, your share price has been a little bit under pressure. Uh, what's, what's happened there, James? Uh, I think it was on about the 1st of August. Uh, the, the, the share price got hammered. What caused that reaction? I think that's absolutely right. And I think it's uh, a reminder, if it was needed, that we uh, we work in an industry that doesn't always tolerate uncertainty. We had some news come out on the 1st of August uh, to say that our the lead clinical trial for our lead drug, Paxalicid, which has been done in a disease area called glioblastoma, the most common and the most aggressive form of brain cancer. We learned that it the drug had not advanced from the first stage to the the second stage of the study. And just to explain that a little bit, the study was designed in two stages, a first stage of about 150 patients, a second stage of 50 patients. In between the two, there's a sort of threshold that it has to get over, a, a test that's applied internally in the study, and we didn't clear that test. Now, I think understandably, the market has, has really assumed the worst with this news. It's uh, whenever we hear about something not going according to plan in a clinical trial. I think we all uh, we, we all sort of jump to the conclusion that, that that's curtains for the drug and for the trial. Right. That may not be the case here. And I should say, we, we don't really have a great deal of information. This study is still ongoing. We're all still blinded to the data. That means we don't have any insight into the efficacy or the safety of Paxalicin. But what we do know is this threshold was a high one to clear. It was quite an ambitious test of the drug. And it's not absolutely certain that we need the second stage to achieve approval for the drug. There's nothing in FDA regulations that say you have to have a two-stage study. Um, we still have about, we assume, 150 patients on Paxalicid, roughly the same in a control group. That's a good number of patients for, for a disease like this. And if, as the data matures over the next six, nine, 12 months, if we see good results emerge, there's still every chance we have something promising that we can take to FDA and discuss with them. And in this disease, in glioblastoma, the need is so great. There are so few existing therapies. There's really been no progress now in the last couple of decades that I think if our drug moves the needle at all, we still have um, we still have everything to play for. So I think it's fair to say Paxalicid is, is a little down, but absolutely not out on this news. Yeah, and I think that's important for, I mean, and I think potentially, look, I am i don't fully understand the drug itself. I'm looking at it from an investment point of view, and I think it's important what you just said. It's not curtains for Paxilicid. Uh, I can't even pronounce it properly, but, you know, that one, the one that you just mentioned. Um, uh, it's not down and out. You've still got trials ongoing, and it has got some very good results. Is that right? So you're still going to be working towards getting this cleared by the FDA. Kerry, that's absolutely right. Absolutely. That, you know, we, we have to see what the final data looks like, of course. And we'll be seeing that next year. So as I say, right now, we have no data from this study. All we know is that we haven't made this, this transition. But, um, but other than that, we don't really know anything. So the drug could be just miss it, missing it by a whisker. It, it could be missing it by a wider margin. But in any case, it's still we're still only really just after the halfway point 
in the study. So we'll be seeing um, we'll be seeing that data we expect in the second half of next year. And at that point, we'll do what every every biotech company has to do when they complete a clinical trial. They look at the data, they really try to understand what they have, and then they decide their path forward from there. But as I say, there is absolutely no reason to believe at this stage that we we might not have um, something quite compelling still to take to FDA. So I think you're exactly right. So potentially a little bit of a market overreaction, but all, James, one of the things I want to focus on, given this is our first conversation with the small caps community, you joined in 2016. Can you just give us a, a, a bit of an over uh, uh, an overview of what's happened there's been quite a lot of development since you joined the company so can you summarize that for us because i think that's important there's been some big strides with casia yeah carries it well thank you first of all it, it's uh it, it feels like yesterday but but you're right the company in its present form is now getting on for six seven years old and we, we really set out to build a new company in Casia. We Casia was built in, uh, in in the shell of a pre-existing company, but in, in every meaningful respect, it's uh, it's about a six, seven-year-old company. And we've tried to do a couple of things differently. We, we've tried to focus on building a, a pipeline around in-licensed assets. So a lot of biotech companies out there, whether we look in Australia and Europe or the United States, they're based around some intellectual property they've licensed in from a university, but they're, they're really at best on one piece of technology. And sometimes that technology turns out to be fantastic, but not always. And so we've tried to negate that risk for our investors by saying, well, we're going to be somewhat technology agnostic. We look for great opportunities that are currently in other companies, which don't fit strategically for those companies, where we think we can add some value. So if you look at Paxalicet, our lead drug, that was actually invented by an American company called Genentech. And they just decided, you know, they thought it's a great drug, but we're not going to be focused on brain cancer. It's not part of our strategy. So long story short, we were able to bring it into our company. EVT801, our second drug, somewhat similar story. It was originally invented actually by a French company called Sanofi. Oh, yeah. Just didn't fit with the, the, the companies that, that originally owned it. So again, we've been able to bring it into our company. So we've set out to build the company around that. And, and really everything that's happened with Casio in, in that time is sort of reflects that that strategy being put to work. The, the other thing I think that maybe distinguishes our company is that we work very much in partnership with researchers and, and academics and clinicians and, and investigators. We're, if you like, a virtual company. So we don't spend huge amounts of money designing our own clinical trials and, and running that and building huge amounts of infrastructure in our company. We're a very lean organization. We work with some of the top cancer centers in the world, places like Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in, in Boston, really, really top class cancer centers to, to move our drugs forward. And uh, so, again, it just gives us access to both a portfolio of, of drug candidates and expertise that we could never hope to have in-house. Do you, does they, that mean that you're further advanced than some of the other biotech companies out there in terms of your drugs and drug development? Yes, I think that, that would be fair to say. It means we short circuit a, a good yeah. part of the process. Um, so again, just very briefly to illustrate this with Paxella said, best guess there's probably something like about $40, $50 million spent on this drug before it came into our possession. There was maybe six, eight years of work that had, had gone into it. And, and that work had, had come from, you know, this enormous medicinal chemistry team in Genentech, one of the most successful oncology drug developers in the world. Um, we, you know, for us to do all that work ourselves, to do all this from scratch would have, would have taken forever. It would have required huge investment and would have been failure prone. So we, we really leapfrogged all that. And, uh, and, and if you like, so, sort of inherited all, all that um, all that investment from the company that originated the drug. So it, it does it does mean we, we can cut to the chase a little bit because clinical trials are ultimately where the economic value of a drug is. Right. Generated. Yeah. Yeah. So so and that's where you're at at the moment with Paxilicid. Is that that's correct? where we focus. That's right. That's right. So what's the news going forward? The market smashed you badly. Um, I, I think 
possibly unfairly, but you know, I'm not I'm not here to, you know, do your own research, ladies and gentlemen. Absolutely. But uh perhaps they focus more on the negative than the positive. What are the next steps? Where's the value creation from now? Not just for Pax Salisab, but for some of your other products development. Carrie, look, thank you. And and look, uh, I, I think the the bottom line with GVM Agile, our lead clinical study, the, the one where we, we had this, uh, the, this setback uh, at the beginning of August, as I say, that study is still ongoing. We still expect to see final data, second half of calendar 2023. So in, in some respects, not much has changed. We're going to see the results next year. And as I say, like like everybody, we we see what that looks like. So so that that study, as I say, is very very far from out of condition. But in the meantime, we've got seven other clinical trials of Paxilisib ongoing, uh-huh. and and uh, and each of these, by and large, are in slightly different areas. We haven't just put all our bets on one disease. We're looking at a whole range of different brain cancers. And so that as these trials progress in parallel to the GBM Agile study, we're going to learn more and more about the drug and start to open up more and more opportunities for it use. And there are two that I think right now are looking really exciting. One of those is childhood brain cancer and particular disease called DIPG. Uh, everybody hates all the acronyms we have in mm. our industry. But the disease is, the full name is diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, which is why everybody just calls it DIPG. Um, but this is a horrible disease that affects young kids and it's incurable and there's no FDA approved drug treatments. And we've got some really good data emerging, a lot of it led by Australian research, which really shows our drug, particularly in combination with another drug, may well be able to move the needle here. We've got a clinical trial started last year in this and uh, sometime hopefully within the next, let's say six to nine months, we'll start to get some some early indications how that's going. So, so that's really exciting. And, and that opens, although childhood brain cancers are thankfully rare, having said that, brain cancer is the most common cause of childhood cancer death, but but in total, they're, they're rare. But still, this is a real opportunity for us. Going completely to the other end of the spectrum, we've just had some really promising data come out in brain metastases. Now, that is yeah. cancer that is spread to the brain from elsewhere in the body, yeah. most commonly breast and lung and melanoma. And uh, that data is looking great. I mean, it's early stage, to, to be to be clear, but uh, but it's looking about as good as you can ever wish it to, to look. Every accessible patient is showing some response. And uh, and that's huge. There's about 200,000 patients diagnosed with brain metastases each year in the United States. So if we can take even a small slice of that, it's, it's a huge opportunity for a company like ours. So we've got a lot of irons in the fire. There's a lot of things going on. And, um, and I think perhaps if there's a silver lining to this speed bump we've had with the GBM Agile trial, it might be to give people an opportunity to look at actually the breadth of work going on in the company. Uh, James, is is the bra- uh, you know brain cancer because as you say that a lot of these cancers do metastasize up into the brain. Other cancers have had a lot of work done on them. Has brain cancer had the same amount of uh, work done to them, or is Casia Therapeutics leading the way in terms of saying, guys, this is a real issue, mm-hmm. and if we can crack the code here? There's a massive market there. And I'm not saying that in a glib way. I'm just saying more more attention needs to be paid. Carrie, I, I couldn't agree more. I think this has been a really neglected area historically. And what, what we would call primary brain cancers, that's brain cancer that starts in the brain, which includes things like glioblastoma and these childhood brain cancers. Historically, big drug companies have tended to think this was a smaller market. They said, well, let's go after lung cancer, breast yeah. cancer, back. So these are huge. Um, and, and so only really now, literally within the last few years, I think people are starting to turn their mind to brain cancer. Brain metastases, to be honest, it's really just been a case of people thought, well, it's just too difficult. Once people get brain metastases, we've lost the fight. You know, the, yeah. the best answer is palliative care, which I think is a, is a terribly fatalistic way to think about these things. Um, but again, we're just starting to, to sort of learn why that why we haven't been more successful in the past and we're starting to see 
promising results, like some of the data we've been seeing with Paxalicib. So I think, again, the tide is changing. I often say that in our industry, everything is impossible until somebody does it. Uh, you know, when I was when I was training, uh, everybody thought metastatic melanoma was was the end of the road. You know, it was uh, send people home to spend their last few weeks with their families. Um, we've now got great drugs that make a huge difference in metastatic melanoma. The course of that disease is transformed. And uh, we would love to be part of, of a story that does that in, in brain cancer. Uh, James, I want to know how you went from, um, I, I guess, being a, a, a doctor uh, and, and treating people to becoming the CEO of Casio. What was it that you looked at and said, I think that this is a massive opportunity? Well, Kerry, it, it's, um, it, I think uh, so many of us sort of start out a career in medicine and, and then you, you become a doctor and then you really decide what kind of doctor you want to become. Yeah. And I think one of the things that really struck me is that, uh, you know, as, as a, as a, even as an oncologist, as an orthopedic surgeon, as a general practitioner, you see your patients one by one and you, you can make an enormous difference in their lives individually. Both my parents were general practitioners, but, um, but, but it's, uh, you, you're, you're right there at kind of the front line. Working in drug development, as, as I've ended up spending most of my career doing, you, you, potentially your work is, is at a very, very different level of abstraction, but it, it has the potential to change the lives of, of hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands, even millions of patients. And so I, I've, I've certainly never viewed what I do now as, as anything different from what I set out to do when I first set foot in, in medical school all those years ago, but, uh, but it, it just uh, feels like I I've been able to make a bigger impact doing the work that I do than, than I than I uh, than I than I used to do when I was in the hospital. Well, I, I can I can hear your passion now. Listen, before we uh, run out of time, a couple of things I want to ask you. Um, first of all, um, it's the pediatric priority review voucher. I think that's what it's called. Um, talk to me about that because you got have you guys been awarded a voucher or what's going on there? Harry, we haven't yet got the voucher itself. What we have got is something called rare pediatric disease designation from FDA, which is itself not easy to get, but we, we have that. And that entitles us to apply for the voucher. So it's sort of the price of admission, if you like, but we haven't yet got the voucher. Now, the voucher we stand to get if we can get our drug approved for childhood brain cancer. And uh, and the way the scheme works is something that the U.S. put in place about ten years ago, and it's uh, it's an out and out incentive. Uh, the idea is it encourages companies to develop drugs for for rare diseases like childhood brain cancer, and uh, and if we are successful in getting our drug approved for childhood brain cancer, we get this priority review voucher. And what it essentially does is it entitles the bearer to get six months off the review time of any new drug. It's a bit like an upgrade from economy class to business class. It's on a flight, if you like. And, um, and the key thing about these is they're tradable. We don't have to use it. We can sell it to another company. The going rate today is 110 million US dollars. So we haven't got the voucher right now, but if we get it, we can sell it, and that's about what we would expect to get. So, so well, how's really that? How's that? Sorry to interrupt you. How's that tradable? Isn't it? There's the, there's a secondary market there. So uh, so there's uh, there's a couple of investment banks in the US, needless to say, that do a lot of this. Some of it's negotiated company to company, but there's effectively brokers that, that trade these vouchers, fairly specialized trade. Um, but for a big pharma company that's about to launch a drug that might sell $2 billion a year, if they can get it approved six months earlier, well, that's worth a billion dollars to them. That's, wow. uh, that's a lot of money. So paying $110 million to, to buy our voucher would, would be a no-brainer. And uh, so it's um, it's actually quite a clever incentive scheme. And uh, it's it's one where, as I say, we, we haven't got the voucher yet, but we're we're sort of uh, in the game to get one if if we get approval in childhood brain cancer. Well, there's 10 hurdles in a hurdle race. You probably cleared the first seven, do you reckon? 
I, I, well, look, I think that's probably not a bad way to look at it. You know, it's uh, and uh, as we see some of the data come out, we'll uh, we'll see how we go with the remaining ones. James, um, I, I, I would love to get you back on the program again. I really do think that we need to um, talk to you as you move down the chain. You've done so much work. Uh, but let's wrap this up in a bow because I think it's important. You, you know, as I said right at the start, um, early August, there was a little bit of nervousness in the market, potentially unwarranted. People got a little bit fearful. And that's what happens. Sometimes markets overreact. So let's wrap this up. Give us three reasons why you think that the community should be sitting up and taking notice of KZA right now. Thank you, Carrie. Well, look, three things. Firstly, diversification. We we never were an all or nothing bet on one drug, one clinical trial. We've got nine clinical trials going on across two drugs, multiple disease areas, a lot of irons in the fire, a lot of opportunities to win. Um, second, we're late stage. We're, we're not one of those companies where everything's happening in the lab and it's in mice. We're in human trials. We're getting data from a pivotal study next year. We'll have multiple other study readouts between now and then. Um, things are happening and we're at the pointy end of the, of the game. And then finally, I would say huge opportunities here. Even glioblastoma, which is considered a relatively rare cancer, Everybody estimates this at about a, mil, a billion and a half dollars a year in terms of commercial opportunity. When we look at a disease like brain metastases, are oh, easily 10 times that. So some really big prizes to win here if we're successful in what we're trying to do. Well, let's hope it's not an if, let's hope it's a when. Uh, you heard it from Dr. James there. Look, one of the things uh, James Garner was nine clinical trials it's not all being balanced on, on one toe, if you like. Market cap of just $35 million at the moment. As always, do your own research. Dr. James Garner from Casio Therapeutics, thanks so much for joining me on Small Caps. Thanks, Kerry. It's been a pleasure.